So then, thank you everyone for coming. So it's uh, my great pleasure to announce our speaker today. So today, Lucas Amaro is talking about classifying word problems and it's joint work with two co-authors. Please, Luca, go ahead. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to say you something about the uh, our search on word problems and specifically, specifically on the complexity of word problems. So uh, broadly understood, uh, the, the underlying question here, it is how how much algebraic structure is needed in order to simulate machines, in order to simulate computations. And so uh, I really hear the idea it is to try to explore the interplay between the syntactic conditions axiom to be satisfied on the one hand, and on the other hand, the uh, dynamic computation that uh, you would like to perform to emulate a given Turing machine. So uh, as you may guess, uh, this presentation will contain more problems. Unfortunately, it will not contain any penguins. But uh, um, so war problems got a, a very long history. Uh, the research on war problems started, at, I, I would say a few words about that, at the beginning of 20th century. And uh, it developed to a whole industry of uh, many results about the complexity of war problems. But if I might say so, uh, today is a bit old fashioned and uh, we'd like to challenge this. Uh, so this talk also one of the goal of this talk it is to make a bit propaganda or reworking on war problems. Uh, especially what we'd like to propose it is blending the theory of war problems together with the theory of C equivalent, CE equivalent solution that ha has been developed a lot in recent years and that we believe provide a better way of calibrating the complexity of war problems. Now, whatever I'm going to say today is joint work with uh, Valentino Delle Rose and Andrea Sorbi, both from uh, University of Siena. So let's start with the menu, uh, what I can offer today. So uh, to this talk, uh, as I mentioned, I have, to, I, have you, I have to introduce you to two main topics. So one will be uh, war problems. I will say something about the history of those and I will give you some definitions, of course, absolutely non-exhaustively, it's a very broad area. And then I will give you a sort of a crash introduction also to the other side of, the, uh, of this talk, which will be C, equivalent solution. And then I will tell you what's the natural way to hybridize these two. Basically trying to use uh, uh, results, recent results about the complexity of C, equivalent solution, to have uh, a better way of measuring the complexity of our problems, okay? And then we're going to move to a question of uh, Gao and Gerdes uh, from their uh, paper in 2001 that to some extent reinitiated the study of C equivalent solution. So it, it's a question about the expressiveness uh, of uh, finitely presented semigroups. Uh, they really ask uh, uh, which sort of uh, which sort of C equivalent solution could be realized in a sense to be made precise by finitely presented semigroups. I will tell you something about why this question is interesting and I will tell you about our solution to this question. And then finally, really briefly, uh, because I mean a full exposition of the, this topic would require me just another full talk, but I, I really would like to say you something about uh, a certain natural connection between algebra and arithmetic that arise uh, when we consider word problems through the lens of the theory of equivalent solutions. So specifically, uh, I, I will consider uh, the question of how much algebraic structure is needed in order to uh, realize a probability in pan arithmetic or, or in fact in any uh, consistent extension of uh, uh, Robinson arithmetic. Okay. So let's start with war problems. And I would like to make some really high level remark as a start. So of course the idea of presenting an algebraic structure is absolutely mainstream in the literature, but it has two main interpretations. So in computability theory, if you ask to a computable theorist, uh, 
well, I guess it would depend on who you ask, right? But let's say the mainstream view is this, that a presentation of a structure A is just an isomorphic copy of it with a computable domain. So you don't want to have some complexity hidden in the choice of the domain. And you postulate that the complexity of the structure comes from the complexity of its operation. So this is a very natural way to see things. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, in algebra, when people speak about presenting algebras, they, the mainstream approach is different, or at least superficially different. So the idea is that you deal with structures that are easy to describe, but in which a priori, it may be hard knowing whether two terms represent the same element or not. So the idea there it is that rather than directly uh, presenting a structure, what you do it is that you effectively present a pre-structure and that you structure that you're actually referring to will be obtained as a quotient of the, the pre-structure you're presenting. So more formally, obviously what you have it is that a, a an algebra will be presented by from a collection of generators uh, and some defining relations which express equations between these generators. And of course, I mean, this is exactly the approach within which you say that a structure is finitely presented or that an algebra is recursively presented. And at least for the scope of this talk to avoid uh, some unwanted uh, overlapping terminology, I will maintain this distinction. If I say that an algebra is computably presented, I mean, as in the first approach, if I say recursively presented, I mean as, as in algebra. So the structure is in fact isomorphic to the term algebra modulo some C equivalent solution. Okay. Now, uh, remarkably, what you have that in a sense, these two approaches uh, have, uh, are equivalent in the sense that if you have a countable algebra A, there always exists a surjective homomorphism from the term algebra into A, so that you have that A is isomorphic to uh, the term algebra quotient, the kernel of the homomorphism. So if you're dealing with nice algebras, uh, say groups, algebra with decidable type, what you have it is that any countable group, uh, it is famously isomorphic to uh, a quotient group of the free group. Okay, so, and as I mentioned, I mean, the first approach has been privileged in computability theory and especially of course in computable structure theory, computable model theory uh, with some exception. Uh, think for instance of the work of Selivanov and others uh, on positive structures or all the uh, Kusainov and his collaborators line on research on C structures. So these approaches are quite similar uh, to what we are doing here. But in fact, I mean, here we basically start from the observation that many algorithmic problems that appear in algebra uh, already, already are related to equivalent solution, already have the form of equivalent solutions, okay? So, but let's start in general from these algorithmic questions. So uh, specifically, we will focus on war problems. So in 1911, then uh, in a paper considered three fundamental problems of the theory of groups, or at least of finitely presented group. One of those was the, the war problem. So the war problem for a finitely presented group G is just the problem of deciding if two words in the generators of G refers to the same group element. Okay, so of course there's nothing special about groups here and you can phrase the same word problems for any single algebra. And so uh, recursively presented algebra. Uh, and so you have all possible word or word problems and you may naturally ask what's the complexity of those, right? So actually the, uh, of course, the then question was if there was a, uh, an effective procedure that for any single finitely presented group would solve the war problem, right? Uh, and of course, notice that in the special case of groups, uh, in fact, asking whether two wars are equivalent, it is exactly the same of asking whether uh, U times the inverse of V is equivalent to the identity. Once you know the identity in the group, you know all the, we would say, equivalence classes of the war problem. 
Now, uh, sometimes this problem is very easy, right? If you have the G is free and you would like to compare two words U and B, the only things that you need to do it is that you cancel subwords that annihilate so x uh, times the inverse of x, and then you see whether uh, U and B coincide. But what about the general case? Now we know we all know that general cases are in fact we know that it's unsolvable. Uh, interestingly, uh, Dan already remarked that the problems seem extremely hard already for a group with very few generators and defining relations. This is also for a reason. I mean, uh, Magnus proved later that the uh, the word problem for groups with only one defining relation is solvable. Uh, but we know that whenever you have uh, more than one defining relation, the problem is unsolvable. But of course, I mean, concept, theoretically speaking, of course, the problem it is that uh, without uh, uh, a clear understanding of what you mean about for a decision procedure, the problem it is uh, simply unclear, maybe not fully formalized. And the landscape changed entirely with the foundation of computability theory. Now, uh, an interesting historical remark it is that Church in 1938, uh, so just soon after the uh, proof of the unsolvability of the Altium problem, um, he actually speculated that, uh, of course, also problem not obviously related with computation might be uh, uh, unsolvable. And he actually considered the world problem for groups uh, as a candidate for that. And, and he was right, right? So in 1947, independently, Post and Markov were able to construct a finitely percent semi-group with unsolvable word problem. But it took them 10 years more to prove that you can do the same with groups. And in fact, the proof is much harder, okay? So in the case of semi-groups, uh, I don't wanna spend too much time about that. So in the case of semigroups, uh, uh, the, the, the encoding of an arbitrary Turing machine into a finitely presented semigroup is really straightforward. So the idea it is that you will have your semigroup uh, having as generators uh, all uh, symbols corresponding to all elements in the alphabet of the Turing machine you would like to uh, simulate and all the internal states together with some additional symbol H that is taken for technical reason, I will say more about this. Uh, and then basically simply for any possible instruction in the Turing machine you would like to emulate, you add all defining relations which identify uh, words that, uh, uh, that, that in the, identify a word corresponding to some configuration of the Turing machine with the word corresponding to the configuration that you obtained by applying the instruction you would like to encode. Okay, you do that in some straightforward way. And finally, you also uh, include uh, defining relations which uh, uh, would say that whatever word which will contain QH, where QH is the generator corresponding to the terminal state of the Turing machine, uh, will actually collapse to just a singleton QH. Now, again, this is very much direct. It is the obvious way to do this encoding. But on the other hand, note that even for this simple encoding, you really have to, uh, to take care. Uh, and so for instance, of course, uh, computation in a Turing machine is sequential, while uh, defining relation will be uh, just an equation, so there will be symmetric. So you really would like to check that you don't have unwanted collapses, right? That are made by the fact that maybe you have some fake backward computation, which is just appear for the fact that here you are encoding by symmetric relation, something which is non-symmetric in the Turing machine side. But I mean, this can be done and it can be proved that the machine M will halt on input Y, if and only if you have that word H, Y, uh, H, it is in fact equivalent to this uh, uh, single, to this generator QH which represent the terminal state. So then of course, it's enough to take a universal Turing machine to obtain uh, a finitely presented semigroup whose word problem is unsolvable. Now, uh, unfortunately, th this does not say anything about uh, the word problem for groups, uh, which, which of course is much harder. 
the idea it is that this semigroup cannot be embedded in a group because that last condition that you have it uh, requiring that any single war which would contain this generator corresponding to the terminal state must be equivalent to QH immediately would trivialize the group, okay? Just for the uh, cancellativity property of groups. So, and in fact, I mean, the Novikum move construction it is, uh, is much harder, but, but of course it works. And then through the 60s, uh, a lot of people uh, work on try to uh, extend this result. And of course, a natural extension you might do it is, okay, what, what are the possible complexity or war problems for finitely presented groups, right? Or finitely presented semigroups or for whatever algebra you might like. Right. And what we know now it is that, and we have been knowing that for a long time now, is that the word problem of finitely presented semigroups can be of any C Turing degree, or in fact also of any M degree, right? You cannot go better than this. Okay, the width one degree does not hold. Okay, so uh, so basically, and, and for the same result for the case of semigroups, uh, basically this just already follow from post and Markov construction. So uh, then, then the question it is, is this just the end of the story, right? So basically we have that any uh, M degree, C M degree can actually be realized as the war problem of, uh, of groups or as the war problem or finitely presented semigroup. So for instance, is it the case that for these two uh, class of algebras, for these two varieties, groups and semigroups, we cannot actually distinguish them in terms of the war problems that they realize. And uh, well, and the answer is not really, right? There is this distinction. The only problem it is that Turing reducibility or M reducibility or for that matter, any reducibility design for set, it is uh, in a sense too coarse to actually witness this distinction. But a distinction is, is in fact an obvious one. So for instance, what we said, it is that, and that's obvious that if you have a finitely presented group, then basically, as soon as you know the information about the identity, as soon as you are able to decide whether a given word is equivalent to the identity or not, you can decide the quality between arbitrary words, right? This means that all the tasks of designing equality are reducible. In fact, they are M reducible or even one reducible to the uh, task of deciding uh, uh, equality to the identity. But in fact, I mean, it's, it's really easy to see that in the equivalence classes of the war problem for groups, uh, uh, they are always uniformly computably isomorphic, pairwise, okay? So this is a property that you have in the case of groups. Uh, it is a property that do not hold in general. For instance, for semigroups, you don't have it. It's, uh, it's really easy to build semigroups in which you have that the complexity of the semigroup is somehow uh, just located in an area of the word problem. So basically you just encode complexity relative to some generators and you don't touch other generators. But already in the post Markov construction, you can see that if you take some word of the semigroup, which, which cannot really encode any configuration of the Turing machine you are coding, then immediately the corresponding equivalence class in the word problem will be just a singleton. Okay, so this property of having the classes pairwise computably isomorphic is something you have in groups and you don't have in semigroups. And it's something that you cannot really appreciate if you limit yourself to Turing or M reducibility because you really would like to see of how the information is distributed within the various equivalence classes of a word problem. Okay, so here's the easy moral. Uh, to appreciate all computational aspects of war problems, you really should regard them as equivalent solution rather than just set of pairs. Okay. So, so here's our program to systematically revisit the complexity of war problems, but by using uh, the theory of equivalent solution. Now, this might sound you interesting or not, right? It really depends on the kind of topic you might you may like. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, a good reason for which uh, 
for which we believe this sort of research, it's, it's really good time historically to do, to do this research. It is that on the theoretical side by now, we, uh, we have a lot of recent result about C equivalent solution. So we know uh, a lot about the complexity of C equivalent solution. This is something I will say to you briefly uh, in the next part of this talk. And, and so it, it is natural this uh, desire of combining these two research threads, okay? So let me say something about the theory of Sears. And of course, I mean, notice that the word problems of recursively presented algebras are always C, right? So restricting our focus to Sears, it is not too much restrictive. I mean, it's exactly what is needed here. Okay. So uh, first of all, as all of you know, uh, reduction, especially the sign for equivalent solution are very common in logic, not only in computability. Uh, the idea is you would like to have a reduction that both had some, uh, let's say, uh, effective in a, in a very, very broad sense flavor, and also that take account of the structure of the equivalent solution involved. Generally speaking, you have that a reduction of an equivalent solution E on some domain X, perhaps equipped with some topology or whatever, to an equivalent solution F on Y, it's just a nice function, right, which uh, uh, induce an injective map on the equivalence classes, okay? Now, of course, nice function says nothing, but you would like to put some constraint on the complexity of F, as otherwise, uh, as, as long as the uh, number of equivalence classes in E are not more than the F classes, the axiom of choice alone would guarantee you that you have such a reduction. So in the literature, you have too many interpretation. In the scripted set theory, uh, people typically assume that X and Y are Polish spaces and F is Borel, and you have all the theory of Borel reducibility. And of course, I mean, together with possible variants, uh, people also consider continuous reducibility, et cetera. In computability theory, the most typical assumption it is that X and Y are just the natural numbers uh, and F is computable, okay? And in particular, relative to computability theory, uh, what we have it is that the most studied degree structure generated by computable, co computable reducibility is that of Sears, right? So just the C degrees of C equivalent solutions. Now, this is for essentially two reasons. I mean, uh, first of all, because, I mean, it's a fairly low complexity object and uh, C equivalent solution. And also you have some nice properties. I might uh, say a couple of those, which make the study uh, to, to some extent tame. I mean, the resulting structure, it is as complicated as possible, as I will tell you. But in any case, the other reason it is that Sears are appear naturally, at least in logic. So for instance, to have an, an example in the background of your mind as a seer, just take probable equivalence in any consistent formal system. So for instance, take PA, you say that two numbers say X and Y are equivalent, if and only if you have that piano arithmetic is able to prove that they are code for equivalent formulas, okay? or maybe the restriction of this equivalent solution to the any sigma level of the arithmetic hierarchy, okay? Or the isomorphism for finitely presented group, this is a sigma one equivalent solution, or word problems, of course. As I said, any word problem of uh, a recursively presented algebra gave rise to a seer, to a seer. So immediately it makes sense to ask, okay, fix your favorite class of algebras, what are the series that can be realized as the world problems? Okay. Now, and in that paper that I mentioned before, Gao and Gerdes started the sort of systematic investigation of this uh, posit series. These are just immediate observation uh, you can make. It's a bounded posit. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the equivalent solution which collapse any, any two numbers in the same equivalence class, it will reduce to, any, to everything. In fact, it has an initial segment of order type omega corresponding to the uh, modulo n equivalent solutions. And then after that, it is start very tame and after that it explodes, but it is, it's also bounded, it has a top element. And historically in the 70s, uh, people studied a lot uh, those uh, series belong, belonging to the top element. 
having so information that any other seer is computably reducible to those. Okay. So we, we also studied that and we, uh, we proved that the structure is neither an upper nor a lower semilattice. And the first order tier of Sears is undecidable. Uh, in fact, recently, uh, Andrews, uh, Schweber, and Sarbi, they proved that in fact, the theory is as hard as possible. It is uh, computably isomorphic uh, with first order uh, arithmetic. And, and recently in a paper we just finished, let me mention this, uh, with uh, uh, Andrews and Bellin, we proved that uh, if you consider the theory of all countable equivalent solution uh, up to uh, computable reducibility, you have that also that theory is as complicated as possible, meaning that is computably isomorphic to second order arithmetic. Okay, so really, really rich structure and complicated theories. Um, so one, one observation it is that to have some view of the structure and also to be able to individuate some nice uh, subclass of Sears, uh, one basic observation it is that the identity, it is not the least element, uh, not the least degree with respect to all the Sears with infinitely many equivalence classes. Okay, and this motivate a partition of the infinite Sears uh, and they name with this, as I often say, this uh, Star Wars terminology. Then Uri once correct me and say that it's not a Star Wars terminology, it's a beer terminology, okay? So they distinguish between light seers and dark seers, okay? So the light seers are those that have a computable transversal. So you have a set which picks infinitely many uh, pairwise non-equivalent numbers, okay? You can do that in a computable way, even though, um, even though maybe the equivalent solution itself is non computable And the dark Sears, the one for which you don't have this property, the one that are incomparable with ID. Okay. Now, uh, uh, Uri and Andrea prove a lot of result about the, this poset. And maybe here we'll just jump immediately to a picture, right? Of course, this picture is extremely rough approximation. We know way more than this, right? But at least, I mean, we have this distinction between a light side, which is way uh, more well-behaved than the dark side. And, and, and still, I mean, you have like plenty of minimal dark elements uh, over the finite ones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I can now move to the, this question of Gao and Gerdes, which is essentially connecting the world of war problems with the world of uh, Sears. Okay, and, and now before that, let me actually phrase formally what is our uh, desired uh, research program. So we would like to use computable reducibility rather than Turing or M reducibility or whatever classical computable theoretical reducibility to classify war problems, okay? And, and in fact, sometimes will be more demanding than this, okay? So sometimes, in fact, uh, we will refer to a notion of isomorphism. Here we say that two Sears are isomorphic if there is a reduction from R to S, which it's all S classes. Now it's, it's an easy exercise to see that if you have this reduction, which it's all classes, you also have a backward computable reduction so that the two are uh, bi-reducible, right? Computably bi-reducible. Um, but in fact, I mean, uh, obviously what you have it is that if you have isomorphism that you have uh, a computable bioreducibility, the converse does not hold. This has been known for a long time. I will give you an example of two that are in the same computable reducibility degree, but they are not uh, isomorphic. And this term uh, isomorphism here, it is re in a category theoretic sense. And recently with the same, uh, uh, authors of this uh, of this work, uh, we actually investigated also the category theory, the category of equivalent solution, in which you have a morphism, you have a mapping of equivalence classes induced by computable function. This is something that it has been started by Yershov in the context of numberings, uh, and we basically adapted that to the uh, cases of equivalent solutions. Okay. So uh, in this terminology, you can actually rephrase some known results. So there is this result from 1971 by Miller third, 
um, you have that uh, there is a finite representer group uh, with a word problem, which is a, a universal sphere. So the word problem, it is as complicated as possible, relative also to the equivalent solution, right? Relative also with this uh, more uh, fine reduction. So in a sense, this is a reinforcement of Novikon and Boone uh, result, okay? Uh, and also recently, of course, with a completely different terminology, I don't think that they, they know the theory of series or whatever. Uh, Masnyakov and Ozin, they uh, have this beautiful result. Uh, they constructed a recursively presented group with a war problem, which is a dark seer. They call it a Dan monster. So basically this is a recursively presented group whose uh, uh, war problem is unsolvable but also the insolvability is made in such a way that uh, you cannot produce uh, in any computable way uh, pairwise uh, non-equivalent uh, uh, group elements, right? Or words referring to group elements, okay? And uh, this uh, and this result, I mean, the proof uh, use uh, Golod and Shafarovich uh, uh, classical result and basically, the idea it is that uh, um, you would like to build this recursively presented group, group in such a way that the defining relations are constructed very sparsely, so sparsely that by referring to this classical result from group theory, uh, you would have that the group itself it is uh, necessarily infinite, right? Um, so. And, and it's still open whether there exists a finitely presented group with a war problem, which is a dark seer. And probably this question is really hard. So, so now let's move to our work. Um, first of all, uh, uh, we define a certain class C of algebras uh, coming for instance from a variety or being possibly the old variety. We say that this realizes the seers uh, if you have that every sphere, it is in the same reducibility degree of a war problem of a recursively presented member of uh, this class, okay? And the same for finitely realized the sphere's, right? So that basically up to computable reducibility, uh, you would have that the theory of sphere's would correspond to the theory of war problems for that class of algebra, okay? Now we know already that groups cannot realize the sphere's, right? As I already said, the equivalence classes of the word problem of a group are always uniformly computably isomorphic. And this is generally not true for Sears. So for instance, you can build uh, what is called uh, the one-dimensional Sear generated by, the, by K. Uh, this has one, uh, one equivalence class, which corresponds to the Helping set. And the all other equivalence classes are, and all the complement of K will just correspond to singletons. Okay, so we have a lot of complexity just included in just one equivalence class. Uh, what about other natural classes of algebra? So here's uh, Gao and Gerdes problem. They ask if any sphere is equivalent up to computable reducibility to the world problem of some finitely presented semigroup. And, or in other words, in our terminology, do semigroups finitely realize the series? This is a nice question, I believe, for uh, two reasons at least. So one, if true, well, you would have that, it would say that the theory of Sears, uh, it is in fact just the theory of work problems for finitely represented semigroups. So this would give you a nice bridge between these two theories. Uh, maybe it would make the theory of Sears easier to sell. I don't know, maybe not, <laughs> maybe, maybe not, but whatever. It would provide a certain connection between these two theories. And most notably, it would nicely extend uh, uh, a beautiful theorem by Shepherson, um, in which Shepherson basically arrived really close to a positive answer to Gao and Gerda's problem. So he says that if you fix any uniform sequence of C set, you're always able to build a finitely presented semigroup in which you encode the information of this C set in the equivalence class of the work problem of this finitely presented semigroup with some residual classes. So basically, Gallinger, this question it is whether you can get rid of these residual classes, right? So it's basically really very much connected to the, to the fact that 
whether in simulating uh, sears uh, by semigroups uh, if perhaps you had some redundancy right or or maybe not so in the construction of shepherdson it really it's really obvious that these residual classes are necessary or seems to be necessary in this construction to basically take care of some uh, computation path so basically the question is whether you can try to do this simulation in a better way uh, we solve Gangard's question, but because the universe does not collaborate uh, negatively, okay? Well, I mean, that, that was our, or at least my, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the other authors, uh, reaction. I, I was disappointed, but, but eventually, now I'm not. I think that somehow it's better than the answer is negatively, uh, because as you will see, this open uh, many other questions, most of which we still have no idea on how to attack. So not first that uh, if you if you uh, cast the question of Gao and Gerdes for recursively presented semigroups, uh, the, the solution is easy, right? Quite trivial. So uh, a semigroup S is a right zero band if you have that uh, uh, basically all wars collapse to the last generator, right? And we can show it's immediate that the variety of right zero bands realized the series. And in fact, that any series even isomorphic to the war problem of a right zero band. And basically to emulate any equivalent solution by a right zero band, whenever you have any, any serial, of course, whenever you have the information of two elements uh, collapsing in the serial, you just make the corresponding generator to be the same and then, of course, I mean, the right zero band property would witness that you have that uh, for any single equivalence class, you have a representative which, which, which is just the word corresponding to a generator. So the only thing that matter are generators. OK, so of course, you can replace right zero band with left zero bands. And you can easily adapt these to the case of monoids by just letting some uh guy represented the identity in some dumb way not doing anything okay so so you have that uh, uh semi-groups realize the sears but of course i mean the challenge of guitarist in question it is whether they can realize them finitely uh before answering that let me say really briefly okay i still have time let me say uh let me give you some example of uh, uh, classes of semigroups that do not realize the series, okay? So that you can see this kind of balance between the algebraic property of a structure on the one hand and the combinatorial computational property of series on the other. And the fact that you, you really would like this, these two things to be, uh, to connect each other, right? To have this kind of realizability. So periodicity for semigroups, it is exactly as torsion for groups. And of course, the semigroup is even potent if uh, a square it is always equal to a in the semigroup. Okay. Now we have that the following classes of algebras do not realize series. Non-periodic semigroups. If you have the class of non-periodic semigroups, you fail to realize all series. And semigroups with only finitely many impotents. How to see that? Uh, as I promised, is is easy. But it gives you a flavor of this idea of uh, trying to properly combining uh, uh, algebraic property on a side and combinatorial computational property of equivalent solution on the other. So take uh, S to be uh, a recursively presented semigroup uh, of a, of a non-periodic semigroup. So this guy will have infinite order. Well, if it has an infinite order, from its orbit, you can immediately recover a computable transversal of that. And so this means that the world problem will not be dark. Easy as that. On the other hand, take the, the suppose that you have a semigroup with only finitely many impotents, uh, then you can fix those elements non uniformly. And then, with the exception of those elements, you will have a map going from x to x square which is a diagonal function, right? Which maps equivalence classes to different equivalence classes. And there are, as we will see, there are equivalence solutions that do not have 
uh, this diagonal function, okay? So, and one example it is uh, this, uh, if you remember this, uh, this is for denoting the restriction of PA uh, equivalence to the sigma formulas, okay? So, so then you have that in order to realize your series, uh, we just discovered that uh, your class of algebra must contain semigroups with infinite numeric components. So let's finally go to Gauenger's question. Okay. So we actually can show that no class of finitely generated semigroups realize the series, so more than just finitely presented. Uh, uh, the proof itself, it is uh, basically a priority argument in which we di the diagonalize against all the possible war problems or finitely generated semigroups. But in fact, we also individuated the natural property of series which forbid realizability by semigroups. And this is a reinforcement of uh, darkness uh, in some obvious way. A series E is hyper dark. This is still work in progress if you have that all transversal are hyperimmune, right? So you cannot compute the transversal, not even in blocks, okay? And obviously hyperdark series exist, just take some set which is hyper simple and define the one dimensional series generated by this guy. Uh, and they also form an ideal in series uh, they are uh, downward closed relative to computable reducibility and uh, hyperdarkness is preserved by the so-called uniform join of Sears, uh, the uniform join of Sears R and S. It is the one in which you encode R in the events and S in the odds, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, notice that the uniform join, it is not really the join of equivalent solution. Sears, uh, it is not uh, uh, an upper semilattice. So in many cases, this guy will not be the least upper bound. Uh, still, it has some other nice properties. However, we can show that no, dark, no hyper dark sear is equivalent to the war problem of a finitely presented semigroup up to computable reducibility. And notice that hyperdarkness also allowed to dismiss a possible conjecture about group war problems. As I already said to you, uh, we know that a necessary condition for a, a sear to be realized as the war problem of a group, it is that all classes are pairwise computably isomorphic. Is this condition in fact also sufficient? And the answer is no, because there are hyperdark series uh, in which all classes are finite. Okay. So, and, and then of course, I mean, that, that was just the start of the story. I mean, the next question would be, okay, uh, we, we know that hyperdark uh, series would not be realized by uh, as war problems of finite percent of semigroups, uh, what can we say next, right? Are there guys that are neither hyper dark nor realizable, et cetera? Um, and finally, I, I really have little time, but okay, we'll, we'll try to say a few words about that. Just, I really like this problem, in fact. Uh, I, I really briefly introduced a, a provable equivalence in piano arithmetic and its restriction to any given level n of the arithmetical hierarchy, okay? Now, um, we actually have that these series, uh, uh, PA and then these series are uh, universal, any computable, any series reducible to them computably. Uh, so of course they would be bi-reducible, uh, but in fact, they are not isomorphic, right? And this is just because uh, PA uh, has a diagonal function. Uh, provided by just the negation, assuming that PA is consistent. So, so interestingly, this means that in the case of Sears, you don't have the counter schroeder bernstein property, or if you wish, I mean, you don't have Mahil isomorphism theorem. Um, so, and this motivate a long-standing study about the classification of all isomorphism types within the universal Sears. So here's a fascinating problem how much algebraic structure is needed to encode arithmetical probability into a word problem, right? So how much algebraic structure is needed in order to realize uh, uh, arithmetical probability, in order to realize uh, uh, the uh, PA equivalence? 
Now, by just taking the Lindemann-Tarski algebra, uh, uh, what you have, uh, and it's an old result of Puer, Purell and Kripke, you have that there is a Boolean algebra with a word problem computably isomorphic to PA. In that paper, we recently proved that, that in fact, I mean, you can do that with less structure. So there is a non-commutative ring, hence non-Boolean, with a word problem computably isomorphic to PA. The question that we are we really would like to solve it is whether you can do that with a finite representative group or just with a group, even recursive representative. And we don't know how to do that. It seems hard uh, because I mean all known technique to encode arithmet arithmetic inside the word problem really require to have at least two different operation to emulate Boolean connectives, basically to distinguish conjunction and disjunction. And we don't know how to do that with having only one group operation. Okay, so that's all. And these are many possible direction one can go, but maybe I will stop here. And uh, if you're interested, I can say you things about this possible direction. Okay, this is a need for one question, but okay, so that's it. Okay, many thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your nice uh, talk. So we have time for questions. Are there any questions? Yes, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, for, thank you very much for your talk first. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I want to see if I have it straight. Did you say that uh, every M, de M degree can be realized as a word problem of a finitely presented group? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I actually, I don't think that's correct. I, I think it's that every truth table degree can be represented. Uh, I think it's correct for semi-groups, finitely presented semi-groups, but uh, actually, unless I made a mistake, uh, I proved long ago that a cancellation semi-group you, you cannot represent all M degrees with word problems of can, cancellation semigroups. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, thanks for for pointing this, uh -huh. uh, definitely. Okay, so for, for semigroups, certainly you can do that. And I, I mean, it's basically post and Markov uh, things. And also, I mean, up to Turing degree, I'm sure you can, but okay. Right. Yeah, it, it, it I had, believe you. Uh, I believe it was Don Collins that, that, that did it for uh, truth table degrees, and that was actually uh, quite a bit of work compared to Turing degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, um, I think this this raises the question: one might want to look at cancellation semigroups as an intermediate case between um, semigroups and groups. Um, so, you know, like yeah, sure, sure. This, the yeah. final question, you have various questions of yours you might ask for cancellation semigroups. Okay, okay, okay. So, great. I mean, definitely, this is one direction. I mean, I didn't, I didn't say anything about that, but of course, I mean, uh, groups and semigroups here are just paradigmatic case, but, but we or I would be interested in any other nice class of algebra. And definitely, I mean, cancel, consolidative, it, totally makes sense in this direction. Okay, any other questions? I think uh, Peter from Ando Bose has raised his hand. Yes. Don't mute myself. Um, I have a question about whether there, on the formal aspect of presentation, there is a difference between the situation where you have a finite set of generators and relations expressed as pairs of words between mm. words of the generators or where, whether you have a more abstract approach that you have words with variables where you can substitute arbitrary words for the variables. We don't see a direct way of encoding one approach into the other because uh, if you can substitute for a variable you basically generate 
infinite families of pairs? Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. But then what about the reducibility? Still, you would take, uh, let's say, to Turing reducibility in that case. Because, I mean, I, I suspect that as long as you stick with uh, a set theoretic reducibility, then basically you don't really, for instance, let's say, map, uh, preserve uh, uh, the mapping of classes. But, but, but maybe I, I'm missing something here. Well, it's just a matter whether if you have a law like being associative, it throws in far more relations than if you just have a pair of words on the generators, which you declare to be equivalent. So basically you can have two approaches to what it means to have a representation of an algebraic structure and whether that makes a difference with respect to the computability theoretical aspects. Okay, okay. So I, I should probably think more about this. Uh, but but th thanks for that. I mean, I think your talk was uh, in the language of having relations only between explicit pairs of words on generators. Yeah, yeah, definitely, right? definitely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. This, this absolutely. And it certainly can be the case that if you allow some variables or parameters, then basically the, the expression of it would change. But this is, this is something really I'm not familiar with. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, Yuya has raised her hand, so please go ahead. Um, on the, the, just at the end, you were mentioning the difficulty of getting two operations to give you one in some coding. And there is the, the coding of, uh, going back to Maltzeff, of um, rings in their Heisenberg groups, mm -hmm. which is one method for doing that. In a, in some recent, recent work with a big group of collaborators, we have uh, a way of, uh, sort of interpreting a field in any field in its um, in its Heisenberg group that gets rid of the parameters that Maltzoff used. So. Uh, okay, okay, so gr great observation. So th thanks for that. This certainly seems promising. Uh, one one difficulty for that, uh, uh, let's say really one general difficulty, uh, it is that uh, at least in the known construction, the one that we have it here, or basically, I mean, all intuitive way in which, in which you can uh, try to encode PA into the word problem of an algebra. Uh, it, it really seems in our construction that you would like one class to behave as the zero and one R class really to behave as the one. And this yeah. is completely different behavior. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so, so, so this is really one problem. It, it is not, not only that you, uh, you have only one operation at disposal, it is really that somehow you would like these equivalent classes to have different behaviors. Yeah. Okay, any further questions? or comments. I do not see any hands raised at this point, but if someone has a question without raising the hand, please go ahead. So if that's uh, not the case, then I think we should uh, thank Luca again for his very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for, for joining the seminar. As usually, um,